My name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Associate General Counsel at the Filecoin Foundation for Civil Liberties and Cybersecurity Policy and a Special Counsel at the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation uh, where I, I used to work before, uh, before Filecoin. So. Um, and so we're here to talk about uh, D oh, I should also say I'm on the Zcash uh, Community Advisory Panel, so I am also have some involvement with one of the privacy coins. Ah, oh, that's much better. It comes through clearly. Um, so I am a policy person, not a technologist. So uh, uh, the, the topic was about de-anonymizing uh, privacy coins. It will uh, not be going into very much detail about the techniques that may uh, may do so, but I will I will attempt to set the stage a little bit. So uh, once upon a time, uh, uh, this guy named Satoshi came out with a, uh, an idea, a white paper on Bitcoin, and he said some things in there about uh, anonymous uh, exchange of, of funds and, and trying to sort of uh, uh, type up, uh, hype up some of its privacy provisions. But as it turns out that, uh, you know, with all a transaction uh, uh, on the public ledger, that are assigned to a wallet address, this is actually pseudonymous, uh, not anonymous. So that if, uh, if ever a particular wallet address is associated with a particular person, then you can look and see all the other transactions that that uh, wallet address has ever done because they're on the public blockchain. Uh, and uh, over time, as more uh, interest came in, in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, uh, the technologies that can trace where uh, where funds came and, and went and how they were spent and tie all this piece of information became much, much better. Uh, there's an organization called uh, uh, Chain Analysis, who that's their, their business, is to uh, review and uh, analyze and number crunch uh, information on public ledgers to f trace where the flows of, of money are going. And... Uh, for most people who uh, who use a, a cryptocurrency, at some point or another, they will associate their wallet address with a name. Perhaps if they signed up for an account at uh, Coinbase, uh, or pretty much anywhere where you could turn your cryptocurrency into uh, cash, uh, they're going to do some uh, KYC, know your customer, and this will this will connect your uh, your transactions. So this. Uh, kind of removed a bit of the promise, the financial privacy promise of, of cryptocurrencies. Uh, and then some, uh, some people made new cryptocurrencies that attempted to bring back some of that privacy uh, promise. So uh, in the talk description, Monero was, uh, was mentioned. That's one of them. Uh, there's also uh, MobileCoin, which uh, uh, was, was created with the idea that it would be a way of sending payments on the Signal app. Um, and uh, add, add additional privacy features. Zcash is a fork of, of Bitcoin, except with a possibility to do a shielded transaction where it uh, uh, puts using ZK proofs information to show that your transaction has happened on the ledger, thus fulfilling some of the ledger's transparency issues, but not associating it with the, uh, with the wallet address. So uh, that's basically the, the situation, and what I'll be talking about is why do we care? Why does this matter? Um, and uh, this is, you know, the, the values of privacy and, and financial privacy. So uh, some, of, some of the reasons why this, this might matter uh, is to be able to avoid financial uh, censorship, that uh, there has been a lot of instances in which uh, prominent centralized institutions like the Visa MasterCard duopoly or PayPal uh, have uh, applied financial censorship, and we can get a bit more, but uh, they are, they're subject to pressure to uh, forbid transactions even for lawful activities. Also, just for the, the protection of privacy, um, that uh, privacy is a fundamental right. And 
why that is particularly important is not only is it its own fundamental right, but it protects other rights like freedom of expression, freedom of association, uh, due process, uh, and then uh, also cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, incentive systems can help support, uh, financially support a decentralized future, uh, and that can also push away from having these centralized points of control. So, turn more and drill down a bit on financial uh, censorship. Uh, financial institutions and payment intermediaries will, uh, from time to time, shut down accounts or prohibit transactions, which can have a lot of ramifications for free expression online. Um, and then online services will rely upon these financial institutions to ensure they continue to operate to get the funds to make the transactions with their users. So one of the first examples where, where I saw this come up was a long time ago uh, in 2010, and WikiLeaks had just published some information about the uh, Iraq War that annoyed a lot of people uh, in Congress and in, in the corridors of power who then put pressure on Visa and MasterCard successfully to cut them off from being able to accept donations via credit card, which it is, you know, was the pr most prominent way of, of them getting donations up till that, up till that point. And this, uh, if, it was, if they passed a law to say that uh, uh, you cannot donate to WikiLeaks, that law would be challenged as unconstitutional, would go through the court system, and I think it would be struck down. But if a uh, politician calls up Visa MasterCard and says, hey, you know, this is, this is bad. We don't like to support this. Would you, would you cut them off? Then, uh, as, a, as a private company uh, who is doing this at the request of but not the order of the government, they can shut it down. Uh, based on the say on our, their code of conduct or, or what have you, and then and then cut off these things. And this is a phenomenon known as as jawboning when politicians jawbone private companies. Uh, there there can be a point where uh, they have that jawboning is sort of uh, uh, combined with sufficient uh, threats of government action that uh, uh, perhaps that can get into the state action requirement for uh, uh, bringing the freedom of expression issues. But the idea. Uh, was that uh, 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 you, you know by, by just telling them and asking them to do it politely, uh, um, then even though it's always a good idea to keep you know uh, politicians happy with you, that that wasn't enough for state action, so something could go ahead. So anyway, so WikiLeaks got cut off, uh, and the um, uh, they were able to then start receiving funding in the then very new cryptocurrencies. Um, and that, that enabled uh, WikiLeaks to uh, continue operations. Um, and so it was a way of, of getting around some of that uh, political pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, people often express their political and social beliefs through financial transactions. Another, another example would be uh, membership in an advocacy organization, such as the Electronic Frontier or Foundation. Uh, who has a membership booth just downstairs where you can join. Um, the ACLU, the NAACP, the NRA, these kinds of organizations uh, express a political belief by joining them, and some people may wish to be able to make anonymous uh, donations. Uh, and that enables them to support a cause without necessarily putting themselves on a list that, in case, uh, you know, with a, rise, a potential rising tide of, of fascism and dystopia, this is like you're protecting, it's an insurance against the dystopias of the future to have some privacy in what you do today. And the ability of the future to be able to look through transactions, to look through records and, and identify people who have done things in the past is going to be better than it is today. And you just, uh, uh, you know, imagine AIs being turned towards this task to be constantly tracking on this. And if it comes to a point in which something that was previously lawful becomes unlawful, uh, and uh, then a uh, non-rights respecting regime comes into power to find the people who had done that thing previously, even though it was legal at the time, your protection against that is to be able to do so with anonymity, with with uh, with a, in a private uh, transaction, this so helps your your freedom of association, 
uh, as well as the ability to do your uh, political beliefs. And it's not just uh, supporting organizations. It could be also like subscribing to a publication, uh, you know, the music, video books you can see consume can say a lot about your political beliefs and you may wish to not have that in uh, going down on your permanent record um, or you know subscribe to a podcast or a channel any any place you do this and many of those things also involve or need to have a way of providing financial support to the institutions behind them so that they can continue to operate and again, then this opens up by that financial censorship and the right of association and then your right of ex expression. And this, uh, this persists to this day. There are many uh, policies uh, in the major uh, uh, financial services organizations that re result in removal of speech that is lawful and the government would be prohibited from, uh, from censoring. Uh, it it often prevents lawful but morally disfavored activities. So it comes up a lot in the uh, adult entertainment industry uh, with LGBT material. There are sort of issues where things are uh, uh, constitutionally protected and lawful, but the current political climate is trying to snuff them out. And this is an avenue in which it goes. Uh, and so the internet can't be a true global form for expression if communication and payment services operate as the morality police. Now, even putting aside uh, the financial censorship, there's also an intrinsic value in having some privacy in what you, what you do, uh, that it protects the ability to have and share your political and social ideas. Um, there's many ways of looking at privacy. One of the ones I, I particularly appreciate, uh, it's come from a quote from uh, Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court justice from uh, probably about 100 years ago. Uh, describe privacy as the right to be left alone, the most comprehensive of our rights and the right most valued by civilized men. And the right to be left alone uh, sort of encapsulates this in a way because it is it, you have a right to be left alone like none of your business which push, pulls privacy away from the, well, what do you have to hide? Or the notion that, you know, you, you are only getting privacy because you're engaged in an activity that might be untoward or unlawful. And if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear because it's a right just to be left alone to do your own business. Um, and that protects your autonomy and they, they also the control over the flow of information uh, gives you choice uh, and the ability to ha give or withdraw consent in how your information is treated. And as we were saying, like, it protects against the dystopian, you know, the machines from the future that will look back on uh, everything that was done today and pass their judgment. Um, and... Uh, in addition, other other things that that uh, can come up when you are you involved in a in a private transaction, uh, besides organizational memberships and media, your medical expenses could reveal information about your conditions. Uh, transactions for disfavored medical care can lead to prosecution. Uh, your shopping history can show your interests and it can be used to suggest what your intents are. And this is really coming to uh, actually uh, a, a very real thing here in the, in the United States where uh, in the post-Dobbs uh, era, there are financial transactions like services at a uh, uh, women's health care facility that will be lawful in some jurisdictions but unlawful in another. And the evidence of those transactions could be used to prosecute somebody even if they went beyond uh, state lines to do it in a in a place where it was lawful or could be used to go after uh, organizations who are trying to support those communities perhaps by finding funding to someone who needs to travel out, out of state uh, in order to go to a more uh, permissive jurisdiction and like this in many countries around the world there's a notion of dual criminality for international uh, uh, cooperation on law enforcement that things should be criminal in both jurisdictions. Uh, but we haven't really solidified quite as much of the dual criminality for a lot of the uh, subpoena and uh, you know, uh, uh, forced disclosure, uh, and lawful law enforcement investigations uh, in, in the US, in, in part because it was with, you know, under the Constitution, under a rights respecting uh, regime, there wouldn't be that that strong of a, of a difference. Now, there were some times where there certainly are things that are lawful in one state and another, and like an early uh, example of, 
this was first medical and then recreational uh, marijuana being lawful in some some categories but at least even in places where it's unlawful they generally have been very tolerant of that and not trying to identify and go after people who may have engaged in those transactions outside of their uh, jurisdiction and we're seeing something different at least being signaled by some of the uh, some of the current states uh, and um, Oh, another another uh, uh, brief uh, brief word on this is that uh, uh, in addition to uh, using a privacy coin uh, to protect privacy, there are uh, things known as mixers, um, and very uh, one one of the more prominent uh, mixers. Uh, sorry, I should say what a mixer is. A mixer is a pool in which people deposit uh, coins and. Uh, then uh, those coins get transferred amongst themselves and, and moved around a bit, and then uh, the person withdraws a coins that uh, are, are random, but like probably not the original coins, and it is designed to sort of add uh, via engineering that privacy protective principle that uh, was was never uh, didn't turn out to be in in Bitcoin and, and so many of the other uh, public ledger uh, derivatives, um, and it was a, as a methodology of of adding privacy onto uh, onto the situation later. Uh, one of those mixers, uh, Tornado Cash. Uh, has gotten into, well, uh, quite a bit of trouble uh, for this. So uh, about a year ago, they were placed, uh, a Tornado Cash, the software, uh, was placed on the OFAC, the Office of Financial Assets Controls, uh, specially designated nationals list as a sanctioned uh, entity, saying that, uh, you know, under, under U.S. sanction law, one could not uh, do a transaction with this piece of software. Uh, this is a new thing uh, that to place a software on the specially designated nationals list. You may note from the name of this list, it seems like a bit, it's not the specially designated software list. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it was it was placed placed on there, um, and uh, this led to uh, Tornado Cash. Uh, it was an open source project. It was on on GitHub and the. Uh, GitHub repository was taken down by GitHub, uh, and perhaps uh, an overly cautious uh, maneuver. Uh, at the time, I was working at EFF, uh, and there uh, EFF represented uh, Professor Matthew Green, uh, who uh, is a cryptography professor at Johns Hopkins, and uh, Matt put up the Tornado Cash uh, code again on, on GitHub. Uh, and uh, uh, the OFAC uh, did not take the bait and uh, let, let that go. And then uh, not too long after that, they issued a, uh, no, no direct response, but they issued an FAQ clarifying that the professor put it up for purposes of teaching. That was totally fine. Uh, so we know that at least. And I think it actually would be unconstitutional for them to say even it was on the sanction list that it could not be published. That issue should have been resolved uh, uh, many years in the first round of the crypto wars when uh, there was an attempt to remove a uh, encryption program, a uh, free open source encryption program from the internet saying it was a sanctionable uh, uh, munition. Uh, and uh, it was established that, that code is, is speech, and even if uh, Tornado Cash, the software, is on the sanction list, that shouldn't mean that the code itself uh, is, um, is not, uh, it cannot be published. Uh, and then uh, not too long after it was placed on the list, then one of the developers, one of the sort of three core developers who was in the Netherlands, was arrested by the Netherlands. Uh, and, and held uh, without any clear explanation of what the particular charges were uh, for, for a long period of time. Uh, and then more, most recently, the two other developers who were in the United States, they were indicted uh, for conspiracy to uh, be involved in uh, money laundering and operating a money transfer service. Um, uh, in violation of uh, the requirement to register a money transfer service, that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Their their indictments, um, 
and uh, so that that is quite upping up in the game, and it sets a a, uh, a chill on people who work on o- open source privacy enhancing technologies that could be used for for bad acts. And I, should, I guess I should also make clear that the the impetus behind this was the accusation that the Lazarus Group, which is a uh, an APT, an advanced persistent threat that is a uh, associated with North Korea, was uh, uh, you know using tornado cash to launder uh, large sums. Um, and I think, you know, that, that uh, uh, m- certainly merely publishing software that someone then, you know, compiles, runs, and then uses to, uh, uh, to do something uh, is, uh, should not be leading to liability if someone misuses that is also kind of interesting that this software is on the on chain uh it is a smart contract on the ethereum uh network and so it's out there whether whether you like it or not uh until someone stops any instance of the uh, ethereum blockchain from uh from being uh uh, published uh or operated and that's uh, that's a pretty hefty task uh, so it does raise some, you know, this hitting on some of the anti-censorship uh, 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 properties of blockchain uh, uh, technologies. Um, but uh, uh, it would be good to get that clarified that, uh, you know, open source software, uh, it takes a lot of contributors who are providing their, you know, time and energy uh, generally for no no compensation but just for making the world a, a better place and to have the possibility that in exchange for doing so they actually would be taking on liability for potential uh, misuse uh, is quite scary and I think that that is how the law would treat this if it was properly before a, a court. Uh, the indictments are alleging a whole bunch of additional activities that uh, they say that these uh, developers did so uh, potentially distinguishable uh, on those, but we'll see how those those cases go, and they, they do have uh, good counsel. Uh, and then there also were several uh, uh, challenges to the placement of Tornado Cash on the uh, especially designated national list, saying that was uh, beyond the authority of OFAC to do so, that are winding their way uh, through the courts. Uh, and uh, with, with that, I've kind of come to the end of my prepared remarks, and we still don't have Rich, so it's time for questions. And let them rip. Yeah, okay, I think you're... For, oh, yeah, you got, you got the tossy thing? Ah, line up for the microphone then, yes. How do we fight know your customer? Well, uh, so... I think the the short, but then shortly thereafter getting complicated answer to that is uh, overturn the third party doctrine. And uh, the the more complicated version is, so hey, there's this thing called the third party doctrine. And the third party doctrine is that basically if your information is held by a third party, then you have given up some of your privacy in it. And if you held it in your house, you would have sort of the maximum level of privacy in it, protected by the Fourth Amendment and all of that. Uh, But if you give it to a third party, I mean, obviously you don't care about it. Uh, And these came around with some some cases from like 40-ish years ago. Uh, One of them was involving a a bank and some bank records. uh, And... um, this uh, I said, well, you know, these bank records were available without a warrant uh, because of the third party uh, doctrine. And since then, we've lived in a world uh, for the last couple of decades in which we do all these things online where there are third parties up in our grill all day long. Uh, like, you know, look at email and when email first came out it would be downloaded to your computer would stay in a server for a very brief period of time and then came gmail and everyone's mail was held by a third party forever and indeed a court determined uh that you do have a fourth amendment protections for your email like these are some of the cracks in the third party doctrine another one in the carpenter case before the supreme court uh they they found that tracking somebody uh uh, by your cell phone just because you had to have uh, your cell phone provider know where your phone was so you could get phone calls didn't mean that you were giving up your privacy in your location so there has been some cracks in the third party doctrine but basically the bank secrecy act which is also involved in 
having not much secrecy, um, is built on you know the, the the foundations of this third party doctrine. Now this doesn't mean that that they can't get information from a bank. It means they have to get warrants for information. And I guess I, I had alluded to this before about how uh, privacy can protect various rights. One of them being due process. Well, that is to make sure that they have to go get a warrant to breach your privacy, and that protects due process. All right. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Isaac. I don't work on this stuff directly, at least not the privacy preserving coin stuff, but I work in a relatively small company that does uh, Heliax. So I have some tornado cash questions, but I'm just going to do one and then leave. Um, why uh, tornado cash and not Zcash? Or is Zcash next, and, and should other privacy preserving coins be worried about the same treatment? I am so. Why is Zcash and, uh, sorry, why, why Tornado Cash and not Zcash? Well, one is they're different things. So uh, Tornado Cash is, is, a, is a mixer, uh, and it adds privacy protections to uh, Ethereum uh, transactions. Uh, Zcash is a privacy coin, and it, it has uh, a transparent mode and a shielded mode, so people who are using it can opt to have a shielded uh, transaction or, or opt to have it uh, uh, transparent. So they're, they're a bit different on a sort of a technical and how, how they work a level. Um, and uh, if you ask the government, perhaps they might say it's because the Lazarus Group was, uh, and you know, other uh, ransomware organizations were using Tornado Cash. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Zcash is not yet popular in those communities. Um, uh, Monero, uh, unfortunately, is popular in the, those communities. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and well, why shouldn't they, they have to worry? Well, I think that, that uh, uh, the law should be on their side, but these are a lot of untested uh, cases and creating something in which someone can uh, opt to engage in a private transaction, much like, you know, uh, if you, uh, I don't know, give some, someone some very valuable baseball cards and they take them and you do it privately with nobody looking, you may have engaged in some activity that like uh, uh, perhaps you were violating tax laws or doing something else all the time, but that doesn't mean that they'd be, you know, the uh, producer uh, of the baseball cards are uh, liable for, for what you have, have done. But yeah, I mean, I think that, that those who try to add privacy enhancing technologies, especially to financial transactions, do have something to be concerned about and care about the developments of policy in this area and to try to make sure that we keep our rights with us, even as, you know, try as one should uh, to stop ransomware and stop, uh, stop a lot of these bad actors from, like, nobody wants the North Koreans to get billions of dollars it's a, it's a pretty bad they're definitely bad on human rights hey how's it going my name's robert um i'm just curious um don't know if you're aware of this project or not but what if you're aware what are your thoughts on this particular project called pirate chain that focuses using zk snark zero knowledge starks in order to basically do a more kind of default version of what um zcash does but like i said it's probably by default similar to monero in that regards and um, I guess my other part of my question is, essentially, how is it that, I guess my question is, how, is, are, they, how are they able to effectively govern and just kind of make up legislation pertaining to crypto when effectively it's a field that kind of updates itself every three to four months? You get what I'm saying? So it's like you're, you're kind of behind the curveball anyway when you're constantly making up these legislations. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. So I think there's two two good questions there. On the first one, uh, I'm not super familiar with that with that particular uh, project. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a lawyer and a policy guy, not a, not a technologist. But I uh, have uh, from from the technologists I've spoken to, there's amazing things you can do with zk proofs, and the level at which I understand that is a zk proof is a mathematical technique that can prove a thing without giving the extraneous information. And so an example of this, just 
for everybody else is like, let's say you go to a bar and they're like, you know, well, prove that you're over 21. The current method is you hand over your driver's license and then, uh, and unfortunately for many bars, they will then like run it through a machine or take a copy of it or otherwise get your like, you know, height, weight and address and so on, all the extraneous information. But with a ZK proof, it could be mathematically proving that your driver's license says that you're over 21 without giving the rest of the information, uh, and thus you are limiting the amount of information. And then applied to uh, uh, you know Bitcoin or sorry Zcash or whatever other other privacy coin technologies, it is proving that the the transaction occurred. It's moving the coins from one wallet to another, uh, but without providing the uh, extraneous uh, uh, information or that that is known just to the uh, participants in the transaction. And if I was understanding you correctly, the the, the uh, a, a key difference there is that it provides this for all transactions, um, and I uh, totally get that. Uh, that you know that that is a. Uh, a a way to ensure that people have the privacy, and then with the, with Zcash, where there are transparent and shielded transactions, you 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 are choosing. Uh, you know, there's some convenience with having the ability to do transparent transactions, so that you could, for example, do business with entities that will not do shielded transactions because of their own uh, requirements. Uh, and uh, it may come to a time when we can do shielded transactions quickly and easily, or you know, permanently uh, private coins quickly and easily uh, all over, and then perhaps uh, uh, that. Um, will make it un unnecessary to have a transparent uh, transaction. And you know, your second question uh, is about regulation in this, this environment. And um, one of the challenges with technology regulations, and this is not new to blockchain technologies, uh, technologies change at a faster rate than regulations and regulators can change. Legislation takes a very long time, and in the United States in particular, uh, there's a lot of gridlock that makes it difficult to get any form of, of legislation uh, passed. Uh, as, as you may have seen, if you've been looking at some of the space, not not just on, on, on blockchain, but technology generally, Europe has been taking some of the lead on uh, uh, regulation of technology, just in part because they can get things done and get regulations out there faster than the U.S. has done, but even the bestest of regulation uh, that is perfect at the time that it is conceived, by the time that it goes into the book and comes into effect, it's probably at least a little bit out of date. And then, uh, you know, a year later, it's even more out of date. And uh, uh, an example sort of to illustrate that, because we were mentioning earlier that there was this, uh, uh, you know, it took a while to establish that uh, there was a Fourth Amendment protections in your email messages. Uh, and the, the statute that was at issue uh, allowed, required a warrant in some circumstances, but allowed getting uh, uh, the information from email accounts after six months with, without uh, a warrant. And this was uh, legislation that came from the 80s when most email was done on bulletin board systems and was downloaded to your personal computer. And it was it seemed obvious at the time that if someone left their email around for six months, that they had just like they had not logged in for six months, they had abandoned this account, they were just they were gone. Uh, and uh, then you could see how a legislator might think, okay, that means they've abandoned it. They don't. They've given up their privacy interest. Plus, we can't get it anywhere else because you know they didn't download it. So, we'll make this 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 rule. And then the technology changed, and the the law and the establishment of uh, getting a warrant uh, wasn't until like the the 2000s, so like 20 years later to establish in a court that a warrant was required while this law remained on the books. And so that's like perhaps an extreme example, but this is absolutely true that regulators cannot keep up with technology and God bless them, some of them try, but there's also some that don't really try, they don't care. And we've seen this especially with uh, communications privacy legislations where some legislators are like, all we want is you to have, make strong encryption and give us access. And then the technologists are like, that's not possible. And they're like, whatever, we're going to write this in a law anyway. So it's not easy. Right. Hey, uh, my name is Brian. Uh, it's a bit of a high-level question, but you talked a lot about um, 
financial anonymity and what we can do as individuals to maintain that to the best of our abilities. Um, and if you're not working with privacy coins or you're transferring something like Bitcoin, it seems that nowadays one of the more popular ways to, to push anonymity is to have like a rotating Bitcoin address that's reassigned to you every time you receive Bitcoin in the name of keeping yourself anonymous, right? This is something that even Coinbase... Pseudonymous. Correct, is. but even something that Coinbase, mm -hmm. which to me is largely useless, they know who you are. Um, but even cold wallets do that. So I guess I'm just curious to your thoughts on how useful that is, if at all. Uh, it's not even something I've toggled on just because it just seems more of a farce than anything else or if I'm missing something or... So, yeah, I mean, I um, the, the known method uh, that affects people who are not taking particular efforts to, to protect it is that they have one wallet address. They just keep using that same wallet address. And that means every transaction they've ever done will be associated with them, you know, the moment their privacy is, is breached. If you are rotating wallet addresses, well, now you've subdivided this problem to however many wallet addresses you're rotating through. And if you never use the same one, that gives you some additional uh, protections. If you're doing this through Coinbase, they will then have to go to Coinbase and get your information. But at least they have to go through uh, uh, that, that step. Um, and Coinbase may know all the wallet addresses you've ever used, so maybe that's not going to help you that much. But there's also like, you know, this is one of the great challenges in, in many uh, uh, a privacy you have a number of well-funded industries who are trying to track everything you do. And then you have some various privacy enhancing technologies. They're trying to make that more more difficult. Uh, and this this there is some some back and forth on, on, on this. And uh, uh, like uh, for example, to use it to just to make a metaphor uh, to your IP address, if you had a static IP address at your house, then everything you've ever done would be associated with that IP address for all the things you looked at online. Uh, if you have a dynamic IP address, well, it will change every time and you'll get that sort of extra modicum of privacy. I have to go get it. So that might be like a, a comparison of the additional vibe. But maybe that doesn't give you as much privacy protection as using Tor, the Tor browser, where it routes your communications through uh, a series of hops and uh, encrypts it so that uh, they get the uh, IP address of the exit node and it is very difficult to, to get back yourself. So it may require sort of more enhanced versions of of privacy protections uh, but there's there's some other things so like you know if they are not identifying you let's say you solve the ip address problem at least with a with a browser that looking at things like your uh, uh what browser version you have what fonts you have installed uh the size of your window da 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 da, da it may be readily easy to determine that this was the same browser uh, to a high degree of certainty that it is a relatively, you know, a unique browser or one of a very small set, uh, and thereby track what someone does without any knowledge of their uh, uh, IP address or, or any cookies. So also, I guess, if you're using Tor, tend to leave it in its default so that you look exactly like all the other Tor browsers, and I think Tor puts some additional protections on what information it sends. But nevertheless, right, it, it is, I, unfortunately... Uh, it is a challenging thing, and there are things you can do to help protect yourself uh, with, you know, a Tor browser using s signal for communications, uh, you know, privacy badger as an add-on if you're not using Tor browser, things like that, and you should. Uh, but uh, also, uh, it's going to require the ongoing work of a lot of privacy protective uh, organizations and open source projects to keep those things up to date as best as can against technologies that are trying to track you nonetheless. And I think this is going to be the same thing in a financial tracking situation. All right. I have another tornado cast question. You mentioned that they were being charged with it was something like uh, running a money transfer service. Does this mean that whoever is charging them recognizes Ethereum as money distinct from a security or a commodity? So, um, no. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll, I'll have the, you know, the, the, the longer answer uh, on that is there are, yes, there is some open uh, questions about whether, uh, you know, what is the regulatory framework or the legal framework for digital assets? Are they a security? Are they a commodity? Are they a currency? Are they something else? Um, and the the being in a money transfer service does uh, uh, 
put various uh, uh, obligations uh, uh, upon somebody, but it doesn't also give you the ability and say, and therefore it is money for, for this other law where it's important whether something is, is money. Um, and uh, I think as far as I know, uh, the only uh, cryptocurrency that the SEC has ever said uh, was not a security is Bitcoin, and that one they think is a commodity. Uh, and uh, they have uh, adopted uh, a very expansive view of uh, digital assets as uh, as securities. Uh, these are getting challenged in in the courts, and uh, actually the SEC has not been doing very well uh, in in the courts. Uh, but we will we will see how that ends up. And then on the on the regulatory legislative fronts, there have been proposals. Uh, to create a regulatory framework for digital assets that would would solve for this. And probably none of those things will say that it is money in the sense of legal tender. I mean, okay, some countries have made cryptocurrencies their legal tender. That's what that has happened, and I guess in those countries it's it's money. Uh, but that doesn't doesn't uh, uh, help all that much uh, for, for whether it might also be, uh, say, a security in the United States. And the key thing about like a legal tender, at least in the U.S., is that uh, uh, it is you know, the U.S. dollar is good for all debts, public and private. Uh, and you know has that sort of legal back you can use it to to pay off a variety of things you don't have to uh, sort of get someone to uh, to agree necessarily that like money is the representation of, of value that we will use here and it's the US dollar uh, which you know I don't know if that necessarily you know uh, is something that maps well I think you know with, with cryptocurrencies and other forms of assets people are looking for options uh, I mean I guess some people might want to get rid of the dollar entirely but it seems unlikely so I don't know if I answered your question, but yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, so regarding the tornado cash in Diamond from last week, you sort of alluded to there being other activities that the developers participated in that may have increased or Allegedly, at least. Allegedly. Um, beyond just publishing privacy software, was that the fact that they profited and made a token or something else? Could you yeah, so, um, so I, was, I, I, I while I've read the indictment, I didn't like, you know, fully dive deep into all, all aspects of it, and that's on my to-do list. Um, but nevertheless, yes, they, they were, they were uh, pointing out that uh, uh, they, there was also the, the TORN coach, token, which was the governance token, and saying that they were, they were profiting uh, from this. Uh, and they had a theory that was along the lines of like that uh, of knowledge and sort of negligently failing to to put in these uh, these, these protections. Um, uh, they seem to have access to their encrypted communications because they had a lot of quotes from a unidentified encrypted messenger. Uh, with, of course, the indictment has no explanation of, of how they achieved that, but most likely by getting somebody's phone and just looking at the endpoint. Um, and so, uh, so I, you know, I do not know if, if, in fact, they have done of the, these various things of which they are accused. Uh, also, uh, I think it is troubling that uh, a, a negligence standard or like, like that this could be taken too far as a, as a policy matter if like, you know, you made the Tor browser and uh, were aware that sometimes people use the Tor browser to do bad things and you, you failed to stop them, right, would not be a good result for, for liability. And I think that is that is hopefully not what they are trying to say and will be arguing in court. But to the extent that they do, that'll be a good time to get some amicus briefs in, in there and help the courts see clearly on, on that um, as it would be a, a particularly bad, uh, bad standard. Um, the so we, we can read the indictment and, and get some some inferences there, but like the the the, sort of the meat of it that that case is going to come later on when there's a little bit more clarity, like a perhaps or a motion to dismiss the case or or something like that, which will help clarify some of the legal issues. Hello again. Hi. All right. Perhaps I'll try a broader question. Um, so in the one of the reasons that. Uh, some governments, looking at you, Russia, really don't like privacy-preserving coins, and indeed some of these other cryptocurrencies in general, is that in addition to not being able to see what happened, it makes it very difficult to censor what happens. 
This makes certain kinds of international sanctions especially very difficult. And international monetary and trade sanctions are an economic weapon that countries are interested mm -hmm. in using. This weapon is used often as a threat in an attempt to preserve peace. And these weapons, like other weapons, often have um, undesirable side effects, casualties, and sometimes don't work. But it would be hard to argue that they never work. Mm -hmm. So in a world where the second choice for a lot of countries after economic weapons is actual weapons, is it a good idea to support taking some of these economic weapons away? Well, as a, as a good question, I like your, your inner world. I could imagine the, the trailer of this exciting new movie on sanctions coming in. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, sanctions are definitely a part of the diplomatic uh, toolkit uh, and uh, as, as an alternative to, uh, to kinetic uh, or, or, for that matter, for, to uh, a cyber, cyber war. Uh, and they're definitely countries who are being sanctioned have a strong interest in finding ways uh, around the, those sanctions. Um, so I would say some of the questions is not like whether we should not have sanctions as to whether we should uh, try to do sanctions wisely, have limit the collateral damage of, of sanctions. I mean, one of the pieces of collateral damage that comes with sanctions is that uh, there are people who fund uh, civil liberties organizations and opposition figures and you know uh, other other aspects of civil society in uh, sanctioned uh, regimes, or they would like to. Uh, and in some cases, there are uh, licenses. So, uh, for example, Iran has uh, quite a quite a bit of U.S. sanctions against it, and there is a license uh, available for uh, providing certain technologies, which are useful for people who are trying to express themselves within the Iranian regime. There are ways to do it, and that has sort of been held held uh, open through a uh, a licensing process. But uh, with a particular license, I think it's D. Anyway, there's a there's a particular license there that one can one can use without having to go through an individualized application process, which is which is nice. Uh, when the sanctions on Russia over the uh, Ukraine war came into effect, there there weren't these sorts of uh, uh, exemptions built in, and there's been some talk of expanding the exemptions available and so on. But uh, at first, this was actually fairly devastating for people who were trying to uh, support people who were trying to express opposition, you know, to to the Russian regime in in Russia, uh, and so um, you know that 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 is a area, and in some cases for for groups uh, in authoritarian regimes who are trying to promote civil liberties uh, and part of the civil society there, if they get the money in the you know, traditional you know, go to a bank get a wire pick it up from the bank kind of method, then the regime will do something about that. And so having uh, privacy coins and such can actually be helpful for civil liberties in those cases. But at the same time, absolutely, this technology could be used as a, as a method of transferring, uh, transferring funds uh, to, to anybody, including to the, to the regime. Um, it you know, does, runs into to some difficulties in, in, in doing so. Uh, uh, and... Like for example, if you if you get a whole bunch of, of, of Bitcoin and you're in Russia and you want to cash it out, well, you could cash it out for some rubles, uh, but you might not want rubles uh, these days. Uh, their their value has been declining uh, due to the sanctions. So uh, that puts a, you know a little, a little bit of, of challenge uh, to that because uh, many of those uh, want to get into hard currencies. Um, but yeah, so I guess that that is the thing. It's it, it is is a challenging thing. Uh, and sanctions evasion is a challenging problem, whether it is uh, cryptocurrencies or you know just actual technologies. Like for the, on the uh, Ukraine war, uh, Russia has been able to keep up production of certain uh, missiles and defense technology using sanctioned materials that are being uh, smuggled in through neighboring countries, uh, you know the the old-fashioned way, and they can do that with a suitcase full of cash too. Um, and so, like, yes, so you can use sanctions, but, you know, also let's not try and make that uh, uh, to have uh, extra collateral damage, much as you don't want other kinds of sanctions to have extra collateral damage. Hey, so I actually have a question from a friend, uh, and maybe this, is more f maybe this is more of a technical question for Rich, who isn't here, but 
Um, what would have been the way to actually de-anonymize the Monero privacy coin? Is that done by breaking the K anonymity set? So yeah, that is an excellent question for Rich, who's not here. Uh, so you, you said that there are groups that are tracking, um, that are linking up uh, Bitcoin addresses with the identity of people, and they're getting that, like if you log in with Coinbase, does Coinbase release the information, or does it have to get hacked from them, or how does that get well, out? Well, I guess there are, yeah, there are multiple ways. You know, is, you know hacking is, is, is one method of getting information, uh, but also legal process, and with, uh, and I think Coinbase, uh, you know, I think does, does push back uh, on things, and there uh, their uh, general counsel there, uh, Paul Grewal, is a very smart, capable uh, guy who knows that very well. He was a magistrate judge for a number of years, uh, and magistrate judges are the the form of federal judges that deal with like you know subpoenas and warrants and things like that all the time. Um, but uh, uh, you know, with with a proper lawful uh, process, uh, Coinbase will will comply. Um, and yes, of course, things can, things can, can also get hacked. Uh, so I was mentioning, like, in, in particular, chain analysis is the one that's used a lot by at least the uh, Department of Justice when it is trying to uh, trace what happened with, with funds. Um, and maybe I'll give, give, give an example of, of, of that. Uh, so, like, a decade ago, some, some funds were, uh, uh, bitcoins were, were uh, stolen. And then they rested in some wallets and, and whatnot, and they were moved around, but, but uh, nobody knew who, who was doing it. And then, like, two years ago, maybe, a couple years back, uh, there, allegedly, the people involved uh, made an attempt to cash out that money after, like, a decade had gone by, and they still moved it around through a bunch of, you know, different things from here to there, and finally tried to cast it out. This, one of these people uh, went by a stage name of Rosal Khan. You might have remembered that from the from the news. Uh, and apparently she has reached a, a plea agreement, so I guess that, that'll get uh, uh, resolved. And then uh, there's also another guy whose name is eluding me, but working with it. Um, but in any event, yeah, they were able to trace it through multiple things over over a, a decade and just lie in wait for that moment when somebody takes it from a, a wallet into uh, into fiat currency. And, uh, and in most of those cases, they have uh, a uh, know, know your customer, and then they get, you get the information from the KYC, and uh, there you go. And how does a tornado, why, why doesn't that also be trackable just in the well, same way in in a sense because you're not getting the same coins so uh you can trace like where where like a coin goes from this wallet to that wallet to the other wallet right so imagine like look think if you look closely at your dollar bill you'll see you have a serial number and imagine that those things can be tracked and they probably at some point will be able to be tracked but really 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 well uh but you put all these dollars in a big pile, and you put in like, but from everybody, everybody in this room, we've tossed all the all the dollars in the in the fund there, no. uh, but also put them in a, in a big pile, and you're like, well, I put in two dollars, and I'm going to take out two dollars, but you take out the two dollars I put in, and I take out the two dollars that you know she puts in, and so there's no direct relationship between who's putting in the money and they're taking it out, except that they're taking out the same amount. Uh, and so if you're trying to follow the particular dollar or coin, it doesn't go to the right person. Now, if you t put in 1.328567 ETH in it, and then a day later someone takes out that exact same number to the decimal point of ETH, then they probably have a pretty good idea who put it in, put it out, uh, and uh, they can they can track that. So like you can you can use a mixer in a way that loses some of the privacy principles. Uh, other things is like you know there has to be a certain number of people who are who are using it. You know has to have a certain flow, or it loses some of its uh, uh, privacy uh, principles. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, if you're trying to launder extremely large amounts of money, you have to do that. Uh, that you know, when you have to be one of the few people putting in extremely large and one of the few people taking it out, and so that might give give it away. Um, 
They actually sanctioned two versions of Tornado Cash. They also sanctioned a uh, uh, a beta version that, in its beta form, was limited to uh, one ETH, uh, which was I don't know what it is these days. These days, at the time, it was about fifteen hundred bucks, um, and that actually would be very very hard to. Uh, move any substantial amount of money through there without losing some of these privacy principles because you would have to make so many if you want like a million dollars to go through there you'd have to do like you know oh, close to a thousand transactions or something a little less but uh math is hard uh but you have to do so many transactions uh that in any you know you could screw up in in, in various ways that it would be uh, uh more difficult to maintain these privacy principles through an analysis to piggyback off of what you mentioned before as far as like tracking things of that nature, um, from a lawyer's perspective, what is your um, opinion on impending central bank digital currencies and do you feel like privacy coins and privacy technology in general might be the antidote to that solution? Um, so central bank digital currencies yes that is a good topic uh many uh, uh countries are considering them a few have them uh the one of the more prominent examples is the chinese digital rimbi uh, which is a central bank digital currency run by the chinese government which i think could be called a surveillance coin uh like the opposite of a of a privacy coin so Absolutely, the concern with a uh, CBDC is that this will not only not have the privacy protective pause, they will be able to have things like financial privacy and some of these things that we talked about in the beginning of the hour, but also it will have additional uh, surveillance features that are beyond that which is present in, say, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, the U.S. proposal about a central bank digital has some some very nice language in there about understanding the value of privacy. Uh, we care about your privacy; it's important to us. Uh, but also uh, has you know has to be balanced with uh, you know law enforcement and national security needs, and you know uh, sometimes. When that balancing occurs, it, it occurs in a way that is not friendly to, to civil liberties. That is a hard balance uh, to trust a government to get right. Uh, and so, in general, I am very concerned about any, you know, uh, central bank digital currency uh, program as being a step backwards from that. It is certainly, like, possible that uh, there could be some central bank uh, uh, type of thing uh, that would have privacy protecting features. In fact, there was a bill maybe a year ago uh, called the eCash bill. And this was, uh, it wasn't a central bank digital currency because it wouldn't be issued by the, the Fed, but it would be still nevertheless a government uh, sponsored uh, digital, uh, digital currency. And uh, as you, you might guess from the, the, the name, they were trying to replicate cash. Uh, and as, as you may know, if you're using cash below uh, $10,000, that they're, they, you know, you have a lot of, uh, you know, less forms to fill out and more able to have private cash transactions. Uh, and they were trying to preserve these principles. It was done by, it was proposed by basically some libertarian uh, uh, philosophy, you know, trying to, to make it so you could have something that had the privacy protective uh, of, uh, cash uh, with the major, and a very important difference is that you could send it at a distance, uh, which is difficult to do with, 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 with actual cash. Um, and you know this. This actually would be the, the you know there there is a an old fashioned form of this done by by the U S government, postal money orders. You can go to the post office and below a certain limit, you can just hand them some cash, tell them where to send it, and off it goes through the postal system. And the other person will be able to get take that, take it to the post office, and turn it into back into fiat. Uh, and uh, uh, I forget what the limit is, but something in the order of like certainly less than a thousand dollars. You can you can do this uh, without having to show ID. Uh, so you know there is some history with the government making something you could send at a distance. Of course, not instantly, and having e-cash. So if there were like 
digital postal uh, money orders. They could be sent uh, electronically at a distance, and then people could just go to the post office without, you know, show a code that shows that they are the right person and then get the cash. Anyway, that's a possibility. And with that, we're wrapped. <laughs>